Senator Nelson, good to see you. Congratulations on your nomination. Uh, you and I spoke a few weeks back, and uh, as I told you then, as I've said publicly, uh, there, there are not many Biden nominees about whom I am enthusiastic, uh, and your nomination is a notable exception to that. Um, and, and I'm enthusiastic because you and I have worked together for a lot of years, uh, and I know that you genuinely care about the mission of NASA, that you genuinely care about space and exploration uh, and American leadership in space. And you and I together as chair and ranking on the space subcommittee have worked for a number of years, have authored bipartisan legislation together <coughs> focused on continuing America's leadership in space, focusing on maintaining NASA's position as the preeminent space agency in the world. Uh, and focusing on ensuring also that there are not dramatic discontinuations of ongoing projects within NASA, that we have both seen with any change of administration, there is a risk to NASA, a risk that billions of dollars and thousands of man hours will be thrown away uh, as the agency changes course dramatically. And so we've worked together, whether the transition is to a Republican administration or a Democratic administration, ensuring that there is a continuity uh, that, that continues the, the tremendous leadership and progress we're seeing in space. So I'm very glad uh, to have your nomination. I look forward to our continuing to work together in, in now different capacities. Well, the last time to take the red seat, especially in red states, why the White House has been used on more forceful campaigns, like uh, advertisement on television, for example, to convince Americans to take that vaccine? We are. We are doing that. And by the way, the number of people who are reluctant to take it is, continues to diminish, continues to diminish across the country as they see their neighbors, particularly in communities that have been very. Now, there's a different group of people. There's a group of people who have been reluctant because of past. How can I say it? Past wrongs that have been done to them, experimentation, not sure that they're being told the truth, et cetera. But then there's another group. It seems to me to be, a, um, I, I probably shouldn't characterize it, but Mitch McConnell keeps speaking to them, which I give him credit for, saying the idea, he said, the polling data shows Republican men, particularly young men, don't think they should have to take the vaccine. It's their patriotic right not to do it, their freedom to choose. And he's saying, no, no, take the vaccine. Take the vaccine. And I'll add a phrase he didn't, but I think he believes. It's a patriotic responsibility you have. Last question. <laughs> On Thursday, the Biden administration officials had their first person-to-person -person meeting with representatives from the People's Republic of China. By diplomatic standards, the opening public exchange was tense. The belligerent grandstanding by PRC diplomats was unfortunately no surprise. It's what we've come to expect. As China's military and economic might have grown, Beijing has found that the bullying tactics that people call their wolf warrior diplomatic strategy have often worked out for them. So I was glad the U.S. team used the opportunity to cut through the CCP's spin and tell some plain truths about China's regional bullying and disrespect for the rule of law, whether in Hong Kong or Tibet. Uh, Mr. President, I rise today to say thank you. Uh, I rise today to say thank you to President Biden and to Secretary of State Blinken. Uh, they have both announced today, though it's been rumored for several days, that the United States of America is about to make available 500 million doses of the coronavirus vaccine to our, our friends and neighbors across the world. And I hope the President and the Secretary are willing to offer even more, if necessary. Uh, we've learned a lot about the, uh, the, the virus and the disease that it calls, causes. I'll mention three things. Number one, we've learned that the virus came from China. Number two, we have learned that the best vaccines for the virus came from the United States of America. And number three, we have learned, Madam President, that the pandemic is not over. 
yes, things are better in the United States, and, and we're so blessed in that regard, and I'm so thankful. That's a combination of, uh, of Americans uh, uh, receiving the vaccine. It's a combination of Americans being, being careful in their behavior. Uh, our low coronavirus rates are a combination of, of people who have contracted the disease and therefore have the antibodies. And that's why our numbers are going down. And, and we're also thankful for that. But that's not the situation in other parts of the world. Jordan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the chairman for putting this hearing together today on this important subject. And I was just thinking about, in a kind of a broad sense, how, how serious this situation is. Americans have a Fourth Amendment expectation of privacy regarding all their information, including, as we've talked about, information stored in the cloud. Yet government can come to a third party, like Mr. Burt's company, and with something less than a warrant, get that information. And when government does that, they tell Mr. Burt that he can't tell his customer what's going on. He can't tell his customer that, hey, your Fourth Amendment liberties have just been violated. And when government initiates it all, the Attorney General doesn't even sign off on it. Now, if that's not serious, I mean, the, the, the current situation that brought us here is the situation that's been in the press. And we've had Mr. Barr, as I think it's in Mr. Turley's testimony, he says, very first point, the authorization. It's notable. I'd say it's more notable. I said it's, it's shocking, it's alarming that Jeff Sessions, Bill Barr, and Merrick Garland all deny any knowledge of what took place. Somebody had to sign off on it. So you got the fundamental issue at stake here, and you got no one who's been Senate confirmed, which is part of our checks and balances on protecting our liberties, who's even signed off on this. So I, I find this, as Mr. Gates, I think, led off on our side, the, the idea that we can work together on this, Mr. Chairman, and do something, whether it's the SHIELD law that I've co-sponsored in the past with Mr. Raskin or what have you, but that is the situation. And I'm just curious, Mr. Burt, has it happened to the same customer several times? I'm sure it has happened to the same customer several times, although I can't, I can't say that with any specificity, but I'm sure it has happened. So it could be even worse than I just described. It, it could be. I would just, one thing um, of Congressman is that it, what, one of the things we always do when we get these processes, we look to make sure that it's adequate. We will not produce our customers content, our email or other content data without a warrant. We require a warrant, but we still get subject to this, the secrecy order, so we can't tell the customer that their data has been taken, and only the customer can actually exercise their Fourth Amendment right. But you can't exercise your right if you don't know it's been violated. And even when you suspect it might be, and they tell you, as in the Gonzalez case, which Mr. Turley has cited, they can specifically tell you, no, you can't even, they can't do it. There's no way to go make your case and be an advocate and, and do what you need to do in a court. That's right. The court would say we don't have standing on the Fourth Amendment issue and we, we, we would be told we don't have the right to tell our customer um, that, that they should go look to see if their Fourth Amendment rights have been violated. Okay, so Mr. Charlie, what should we do? This may be the first time this committee, this Congress has actually kind of had some kind of agreement on maybe we can work together on something. So tell us, <laughs> tell us what, steps one, two, and three, what you think we should do. Because I, I do think, I mean, the idea that Mr. Raskin and I, who don't agree on a whole lot, agree and we've co-sponsored this legislation, I think is, is, is telling. Um, and you've heard the comments from both sides. So give us the one, two, three that the Congress well, it, of the United States should pass. Well, uh, putting aside the uh, shield law, which we discussed, I note there are six areas I think you should look at, but I think that you need to strengthen uh, these standards. You need to give courts more concrete standards, give standing to companies like Microsoft, like New York Times, to be able to contest these issues, uh, to limit these types of agreements. You gotta stop relying on the goodwill of the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice says that these types of orders have to be, quote, extraordinary measures, not standard investigatory practices. But if the reports are true, as what we've been reading about, then that and a buck will buy you a cup of coffee. It was not worth uh, right. you know, what, what they, the paper they wrote it on. You need to establish concrete standards that can be appealed and that the critical parties of interest can be in that room. And then we also need greater transparency on how many of these things are being issued um, and their conditions. Uh, you have a number of courts that have complained in writing that they're getting nothing but boilerplate language mm -hmm. from the Justice Department and little ability of the court to say no. Great, thank you all. Mr. Burton, you wanted to? 
Yeah, we, we detail in my written testimony the steps we think the, the committee should consider, but I could just emphasize a couple of them as really critical. First, the restriction on us telling our customer is a restriction on our First Amendment right, and a number of courts have recognized that, yeah. which means that the standard of a secrecy order should be a strict scrutiny standard, but that's not being applied. So the, the corrective legislation would be clear that strict scrutiny should be applied and that there must be findings by the court based on compelling evidence submitted to the court showing that that standard has been met. And even then, these privacy orders should never be longer than we propose 90 days without clear evidence being shown later on as to why they should be extended. We think just those steps would significantly reduce the number of these privacy orders that are even sought mm -hmm. and would certainly reduce the number that are being granted and confine them to those cases where they are truly necessary in the national interest because they would have to show to get that privacy order that they can meet one of those five statutory bases for getting a privacy order, which are reasonable reasons to pr proceed in a, in a short-term private, um, private secret way. Gentlemen's time has expired, Mr. Jeffries. Uh, thank the distinguished yeah, chair yeah. for holding this hearing. Senator from Kentucky. I move to discharge uh, SJ Res 31 from the Foreign Relations Committee. The motion is pending. I'd also like to ask unanimous consent that Anthony Charletta, an intern in my office, be granted floor privileges until December 17th, 2021. Without objection. One cause of famine and starvation is war. Saudi Arabia's air and naval blockade of Yemen has led to thousands and thousands of deaths in Yemen from lack of food and medicine. The U.S. should end all arms sales to the Saudis until they end their blockade of Yemen. President Biden said he would change the Trump policy of supporting Saudi's war in Yemen. But it's not all that apparent that policy has changed. Today, we challenge the Biden administration's sale of $650 million worth of arms, including air-to-air -air missiles, to Yemen. Just two months ago, the Biden administration approved $500 million worth of arms, including maintenance for attack helicopters that are used in Yemen. Now, some want to differentiate offensive weapons from defensive weapons, but really, even defensive weapons can be used to allow a country to absorb attacks in order to continue their offensive operations. The real question is not an artificial designation of weapons as offensive or defensive, but whether Congress is serious about using the leverage of arms sales or of withholding arms sales to end the blockade in Yemen. That the Biden administration continues to reward Saudi Arabia with weapons seems to indicate that President Biden is not really serious about withholding arms sales to end the war in Yemen. Indeed, if this administration were serious about ending the Saudi blockade, they could do one thing, and this thing would end the war tomorrow, would end the blockade tomorrow. The Saudis, I think, would immediately stop the blockade if this administration would stop spend sending spare parts, stop fixing the planes. Bruce Rydell of Brookings writes that the Saudi Air Force would be grounded in short order if we quit sending them spare parts, quit repairing their aircraft. We could stop this war if we rarely had the will to do it. All America should be appalled at the humanitarian disaster caused by the Saudi blockade of Yemen. For years now, ships would otherwise carry food, fuel, and medicine are turned away by the Saudi-led coalition, depriving the Yemeni people of the necessities to sustain civilization. Yemen's one of the poorest countries on the planet. They have to import their food. The blockade is killing their children. Saudi Arabia's intervention in the Yemeni civil war is a chilling example of the cruelty of warfare by starvation. According to the United Nations, in Yemen, five million people are one step away from succumbing to famine and disease. 
and 10 million more are right behind them. We can start the process of ending this crisis by enacting this resolution of disapproval. The children of Yemen who survived Saudi's barbaric blockade will inevitably tell their sons and daughters of the horrors of their youth. And those sons and daughters will tell their sons and daughters. Through oral tradition, a thousand generations of Yemenis will know of the crown prince's ruthlessness. And they will also know that it was the Americans that sold the weapons to wage this murderous campaign. The reports from Yemen are literally a nightmare. The Washington, the Washington Post reported recently of a three-year-old boy who cannot walk or speak, who weighs 10 pounds. A three-year-old boy who weighs 10 pounds. The images are grotesque. His face is skeletal. His arms and legs are thin as twigs. He weighs 10 pounds. His father says that he sometimes goes days without any food. And we are complicit. We are arming the Saudis and allowing this to happen. Offensive, defensive, they shouldn't get any of our weapons. We should stop selling them any weapons until they stop starving the country of Yemen. The New York Times tells the story of a mother who after three days of failing to get a ride, carried her eight-month-old while walking two hours to reach medics to treat the kids, the, her child's acute malnutrition. But even after a week of treatment with enriched formula, the boy still lay motionless on his hospital bed. Tens of thousands of children have already died from disease and malnutrition from this war, and we should not be complicit. We should not be aiding the Saudis. International aid agencies who also have to fight the Saudi blockade to provide assistance, put it this way. The people of Yemen are not starving, they are being starved. The Saudi siege of Yemen is made possible because of American weaponry. The arsenal provided by the United States includes billions of dollars worth of military aircraft and thousands of air-to-ground munitions. Only weeks ago, the Biden administration approved a new $650 million sale of 280 advanced medium air-to-air -air missiles and 596 missile launchers. As painful as it is to admit, the United States is an accessory to this Saudi savagery. President Biden says the latest scale sale is merely to help defend Saudi territorial integrity. But the commander-in-chief's words do not match Saudi actions. According to William Hartung, the director of the Arms and Security Program for the Center for International Policy, the air blockade is enforced by a threat to shoot down any aircraft, military or civilian, that enters Yemeni airspace. The provision of air-to-air -air missiles gives further credibility to this threat, dissuading any government or aid group from bringing in crucial medicines or flying patients in and out of Yemen. These weapons are not purely defensive. They are used as a threat to any aircraft that brings aid into Yemen, and they are part of the blockade, they are part of the problem, and it is our leverage. These weapons belong to the American people. They may be made by private companies, but they are owned by the American people because we commissioned these weapons and we should not give them to countries who are starving children and are committing essentially genocide in Yemen. In other words, no weapon is exclusively defensive and continuing arms sales means continued death and starvation in Yemen. We must end America's complicity in Saudi Arabia's war on Yemen people, on the Yemeni people. If you believe in humanitarianism, if you believe America is a force for good that serves as a model for other nations to emulate, if you believe that the crushing of the Yemeni people must be stopped, then you must vote for this resolution of disapproval. We have a chance to tell the Crown Prince that American arms sales will end until he gives up his starvation campaign. We can end the Saudi blockade and bring relief to the long-suffering people of Yemen should we fail to seize this opportunity, history will not let us forget that America, the last best hope for humanity, failed to protect defenseless civilians from the cruelty of a criminal regime. Thank you. Senator from Vermont. President, I, I find myself in the somewhat uncomfortable and unusual uh, position uh, of agreeing with Senator Paul. 
and let me thank him and, and Senator Lee uh, for their hard work in reclaiming Congress's congressional war powers, another very important issue. The understanding that it is Congress that has the constitutional responsibility to authorize war, not the president, should in fact transcend partisan disagreements. Uh, on November 18th, uh, we introduced the Congressional Resolution of Disapproval to block the sale of 280 air-to-air missiles, 596 missile launches, and other weapons and support totaling some $650 million to Saudi Arabia. And that is what we will be voting on in a few minutes. Let me be very clear. As the Saudi government continues to wage its devastating war in Yemen and repress its own people, we should not be rewarding them with more arms sales. We should be demanding that they end the devastating war in Yemen, which has killed over 230,000 people in one of the very poorest countries on Earth. For more than six years, the Saudi-led military intervention in Yemen's civil war has been a key driver of the largest humanitarian disaster in the world, the largest. According to UNICEF, four out of every five children in Yemen needs humanitarian assistance. That is over 11 million children. 400,000 children suffer from severe malnutrition. 1.7 million children have been displaced from their homes by violence from this war. And some 15 million people, more than half of whom our children do not have access to safe water, sanitation, or hygiene. United Nations Humanitarian Relief Coordinator Martin Griffiths said in September, and I quote, the country's economy has reached new depths of collapse, and a third wave of the pandemic is threatening to crash the country's already fragile healthcare system, end quote. According to Griffiths, millions of Yemenis are a step away from starvation. In other words, this poor country is hell on earth. It is the worst humanitarian disaster on a planet. Under first the Obama administration and then the Trump administration, the United States was Saudi Arabia's partner in this horrific war. In 2019, Congress made history, and I'm very proud of that, and we did this in a bipartisan way, by passing the first ever War Powers Resolution through both chambers of Congress, pressing then-President Trump to end this military support. It marked the first time that Congress invoked the War Powers Resolution of 1973 to direct the President to withdraw troops from an undeclared war. Sadly, tragically, President Trump vetoed that resolution. Many of us welcomed the Biden administration's announcement earlier this year that it would end U.S. support for offensive military operations led by Saudi Arabia in Yemen and name a special envoy to help bring this conflict to an end. But the crisis has only continued. American defense contractors continue to service Saudi planes that are waging the war, and the United States military also continues to provide intelligence to the Saudi armed forces. And now, tonight, we are looking at a new $650 million arms sale to the Saudi armed forces. Now, I am aware that ending U.S. military support for Saudi Arabia's brutal assault will not alone end the multi-sided conflict in Yemen. The Houthis are launching bloody attacks on the central Yemeni city 
of Marib and increasing cross-border attacks on Saudi territory. Violence has also erupted between rival factions in the south of Yemen. A UN expert panel found that all parties to the conflict may have committed war crimes. U.S. policy towards Saudi Arabia and this war should be clear. The United States must do everything in our power to bring this brutal and horrific war to an end. Exporting more missiles to Saudi Arabia does nothing but further this conflict and pour more gasoline on already raging fire. In my view, the United States must support an international observer mission along the Saudi-Yemeni border and spearhead generous international development efforts to rebuild Yemen. This aid should be focused on bolstering local humanitarian and development initiatives like Yemen's Social Fund for Development. We must also dramatically increase our diplomatic engagement to press Saudi Arabia, the Riyadh-based Republic of Yemen government, and the Houthis to accept the UN's roadmap as the basis for a compromise that ends foreign military intervention and allows Yemenis to come to an agreement. The war has gone on for too long, and it's time for the United States to be bold and to be decisive in bringing about peace. Mr. President, I also think that it is long past time that we took a very hard look at our relationship with Saudi Arabia, a country whose government represents the very opposite of what we profess to believe in. Saudi Arabia is an extremely undemocratic country that is run by a hereditary authoritarian monarchy, one of the wealthiest families in the world, whose wealth is estimated to be over $1.4 trillion. Mr. President, at a time when children in Yemen are starving to death, when that impoverished country's health care system is collapsing, when the people of Gaza are suffering mass unemployment and environmental devastation, when people throughout that region lack clean drinking water, the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman bought himself a $500 million yacht, a $300 million French chateau, and a $450 million Leonardo da Vinci painting. Mass starvation in the region that he helped create. Children do not have housing or drinking water, and this guy buys himself a $450 million Da Vinci painting. According to Freedom House, a respected human rights organization, and I quote, Saudi Arabia's absolute monarchy restricts almost all political rights and civil liberties. No officials at the national level are elected, the regime relies on pervasive surveillance, the criminalization of dissent, appeals to sectarianism and ethnicity, and public spending supported by oil revenues to maintain power. Women and religious minorities face extensive discrimination in law and in practice." End quote. Freedom House also notes that working conditions for the large migrant labor force are extremely exploitative. Saudi Arabia is home to millions of migrant workers, many from African countries, but also from Pakistan, India, and elsewhere. These workers constitute more than 80 percent of the private sector workforce, often as laborers and other service workers. They are governed by an abusive system that gives their employers excessive power over their mobility and legal status in the country. As a result, these migrant workers are vulnerable to a wide range of abuses from passport confiscation to delayed wages and forced labor. According to Human Rights Watch, under the government headed by Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, quote, Saudi Arabia has experienced the worst period of repression 
in its modern history, end quote. Human Rights Watch reported earlier this year that, quote, accounts have emerged of alleged torture of high-profile political detainees in Saudi prisons, end quote, including Saudi women's rights activists and others. The alleged torture included electric shocks, beatings, whippings, and sexual harassment. And I think we all understand the nature of this government. Every member of Congress, and I hope every American, knows, and our own intelligence services made this very clear, that Mohammed bin Salman himself ordered the murder and the dismemberment of Washington Post columnist Jamal Khashoggi in 2018 in retaliation for Khashoggi's criticisms of the Saudi regime. We all remember that terrible, terrible murder of a Washington Post columnist. We also know that the Saudi regime has waged a campaign of harassment and attempted kidnapping against other critics, including on U.S. soil. Mr. President, my simple question is, why in the world would the United States reward such a regime which has caused such pain in Yemen with more weapons? My friends, the answer is we should not. I urge my colleagues to support SJ Res 31. Thank you, Mr. President.